Hi, a fan. Why did the person with IBS and OCD avoid the bakery? Hmm? Well, to find out this and more, get ready, fam. Because today, my special guest expert, Dr. Melissa Hunt, and I are exposing the gut-brain connection for our OCD warriors, and I can't wait for you to hear more. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent, and let me be the first to say, welcome to the family, the OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Okay, fam. All right. I have to say, I I felt like so clever coming up with this joke. And I'm not sure if like mom jokes are a thing, like dad jokes are, but I'm holding on to this baby. I really liked it. So why did the person with IBS and OCD avoid the bakery, you ask? Well, because their intrusive thoughts kept kneading up scenarios that felt really crummy. (laughs) Pat on the back, I love that for me. But seriously, fam. Did you know that there is a gut-brain access that links our gut health to OCD and other mental health disorders? So, little story time for you. When I first dreamt up this podcast, I created a word map of different topics I wanted to explore at some point. Like, ooh, what would be really interesting? In fact, I remember my handsome hubs asking me back in the day, what if you run out of things to talk about? Ooh, but we know how creative OCD is, right, fam? And so I told him I wasn't worried about that. But from my initial brainstorming stages before I even had a microphone, let alone a published podcast, I had the topics of constipation, upset stomach, and other upper and lower GI side effects on my list because I wanted to know, is there a causal relationship here between OCD and our gut health? Because whether we're just looking at me or my family's symptom presentation, I've noticed how when that anxiety or distress or disgust really gets going, all the GI things love to ride those distressing waves too. But then when my caseload quickly grew into mostly OCD clients, I noticed it there as well. How is this such a common feature across my OCD clients? So I started seeking out articles and research, and I started trying to understand the connection. And this road led me to our esteemed guest, Dr. Melissa Hunt. Dr. Melissa Hunt is a licensed clinical psychologist, a therapist, and a research scientist who specializes in helping folks with chronic GI disorders. She serves as the Associate Director of Clinical Training in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and she is the premier go-to doc when it comes to understanding this link between gut health and mental health. So I can't wait to introduce you to her fam because this is such a fascinating and helpful conversation. Melissa and I started this talk with a few highlights of what we wanted to make sure we shared with you fam. But as the fam does, we also allowed room for the natural trajectory of our conversation, and we ended up covering a lot of really interesting ground. So the topics we're covering today include, but are not limited to, gut connections and autoimmune disorders, how contamination compulsions particularly can actually negatively reinforce people's likelihood of getting sick, the connection with IBS and how this can create and or intensify toileting compulsions, how our microbiome can be compromised and thusly can also impact mental health, elimination diet, and more. But most importantly, we also discuss a whole lot of hope as well. Honestly, it's such an interesting conversation, and I think you will agree. So let me just mention one last little housekeeping note for any of our new fam joining us, that the information we discuss as well as all the resources highlighted are going to be published over on this episode's blog at ocdfamilypodcast.com. 
So you can jump on over to this episode's blog and I'll have all the goodies there for you, including info on Melissa and a talk that she actually gave for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America that just so happens. Get this, fam. Right now, the ADAA conference is happening in Boston, Massachusetts here in the States. And I didn't even plan that out. The stars just aligned, and here we are. ADAA 2024 is actually in process. For replay fam, you might be like, yeah, that date has come and gone, Nicole. And to that, I say no worries, because the talk I'm going to be posting that Melissa gave isn't from this year's conference, but it is such a helpful talk and has so much great content that I just wanted to make sure you guys had access to that too. Also, relevant to our chat today, I'm going to post a more recent research article that I shared with Melissa actually right before we started recording, which comes from the Journal of Education and Health Promotion, and I found it originally through the National Library of Medicine, otherwise known as the NIH database. So I trust NIH when it comes to research, and it was really interesting because it provided this statistic that I want us to keep in mind as we launch into today's conversation. So Melissa, upon first reading, noted how a lot of papers and research will examine the IBS population for psychiatric comorbidities, which this one did as well. But they found that 15% of patients, 15% fam, with IBS also had OCD. And I felt like that number was pretty high, to be honest. But Melissa wisely pointed out, as the OCD community here, the more important, more relevant question for us isn't how many people in the IBS population have OCD, but rather how many people in our OCD population have IBS, right? So you'll hear her talk a little bit about some research she recently conducted that isn't published yet, but she gave us the lowdown fan that 25 to 30 percent of people that identify with an OCD diagnosis also identify with IBS. Wow. I mean, wow. That's twice the already significant amount that the researchers were finding within the IBS database. And that's just wild to me. So as she pointed that out, what I want us to go into this conversation remembering, fam, is that when we look at our population, the OCD population in our broader OCD family and lived experience community, we can actually find that one out of three OCD warriors also have IBS. One in three. So with that foundation, we are going to launch into this discussion because we need, (laughs) get it, need, like the baker, need to know more. Well, welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast. And today, fam, I have to say I'm thrilled. We have such an important topic that we're going to be discussing today. And we're really talking about what is the relationship between OCD and our gut health and IBS and things that maybe we didn't realize could be as related as they are. And so we have the expert. I went to our field and I said, who, who can I talk with? And I got pointed unanimously to Dr. Melissa Hunt. And so it is such a pleasure to have you here with us today. And thanks so much for coming on the show, Melissa. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. This is a really important topic. Yes, it is. And I can't wait to dig in. And really, my hope for you today, fam, is that you can walk away with some information that can help you advocate or consider something that may be an important part of your treatment plan that can make a huge difference in the course of treatment. And so first off, what we will start with is I've been really interested lately just finding out more about how the esteemed colleagues in this field have really gotten into treating OCD in the first place. So we'd love to start with you there, Melissa, and ask, how did you get into treating OCD? Well, I've been incredibly fortunate in my training and my career to have sat at the feet of some of the true giants in our field. Mm -hmm. One of those giants was Aaron T. Beck, or Tim Beck, who's really the founder and father of cognitive therapy. But another giant that I had the opportunity to interact with was Dr. Edna Spola. And she is the person who invented exposure and response prevention for OCD. So in my training, I was just really unbelievably fortunate to have the opportunity to work with so many wonderful people. And so 
I really consider myself a very broad generalist cognitive behavioral therapy practitioner. So I've been incredibly fortunate in my life to receive really excellent training kind of across the spectrum for disorders that cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful to. And of course, one of those is OCD. And so I've worked with a number of OCD patients over the course of my career. I really enjoy working with OCD. I love my OCD patients. I think they're some of the bravest people I've ever met. And as hard and difficult as exposure therapy can sometimes be, honestly, I never have so much fun and I never laugh so much with patients as when I'm doing exposure therapy for OCD. You know, smashing eggs on a table and rubbing that on our faces. I mean, you just, you just never laugh so much. <laughs> it's true. So yeah, I've been working with OCD for most of my career. Although I would say it's not what I specialize in, I would say I do have expertise in working with OCD. Yes. So great point. So it's not exclusive to OCD, but certainly inclusive of. And really in terms of being a journalist across the broad spectrum of disorders, one of the things that you and I were talking about even before we started recording, which we're going to be addressing even more today, is really the subfield of this overlap where mental health interacts or overlaps and can negatively impact things like IBS or other GI diseases and how really our mental health affects our physical health and vice versa. And so would love to hear how you became so learned in that specific area. Was it something in terms of being involved in research or just working with these amazing giants, as you said, and coming across this overlap where you were like, this needs to be investigated further? Or how did that end up coming to fruition? That is also a great question. And I actually love this story because I did not start out in my career as a health psychologist or an integrative behavioral health specialist, mm -hmm. but I've certainly yeah. ended up there. And that's a journey. Yeah. It came from the combination of clinical work and my scientific research and my efforts in teaching and training. Yeah. So it's really in some ways a very nice story about the interplay between clinical work and science. Yeah. So I had a number of patients very early on in my career who were presenting initially with what looked like panic and agoraphobia mm -hmm. and a little bit of obsessional stuff, but they didn't really quite meet criteria for anything. And really what they mostly had, it turned out, was a lot of distressed fat GI symptoms. Yeah. And I got thinking about it and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So I started doing some research and I discovered that a lot of these people would meet criteria for this condition called irritable bowel syndrome. Mm -hmm. But what really seemed to be happening was a lot of psychological processes around panic, catastrophizing, developing all kinds of safety utilization behaviors and very sort of rigid behaviors about what they were eating, right. when and where they could go to the bathroom. So I got really interested. So I did some basic research on that. And then I did a large survey. I was the chair of the training committee for a major professional organization. And so we decided to survey medical practitioners in a number of different fields who might see what looked to be like panic patients, but was really something else. And we were asking them, how do you recognize these patients? What do you do with them? And how much training are you giving your resident? how to work with these folks. And gastroenterology took the cake. The residency training directors around the country were telling me that, oh, somewhere between 15 to 30 percent of their patient population really had this sort of set of GI disorders that was IBS that was in this sort of basket category with a lot of anxiety and a lot of distress. And the modal amount of training that they were giving their residents was zero. Right, right. And I thought, oh, that's a problem. <laughs> right. So I started seeing more and more patients and I began to develop treatments. And the more I got into the field, the more interested I got. And this has really been a pursuit of lifelong learning for me, where I've picked up a lot of the medical and biological lingo. So I can talk to gastroenterologists and I can go to gastroenterology conferences and give grand rounds for gastroenterology departments and speak their language enough. Yeah. But to really start to educate them about the importance of psychological factors that might underlie or be exacerbated by GI symptoms. Yeah, that is that is really fascinating. And I can empathize because I'm like, oh, I'm so interested in seeing this in my observations. And so that led me to the research, which led me to you. So 
I can mm-hmm. I can hear a similarity in your story of just going, yeah, I understand the fascination and wanting to learn more. I've been open with the fam and I don't feel any shame or need to hide the fact that I have celiac disease. And so I certainly have had my experience with GI doctors. And it's one of the things actually that we were going to talk about anyway, as we look in how OCD and families can make folks more vulnerable towards autoimmune diseases, et cetera, as celiac is an autoimmune disease. But one thing that is interesting and unique about celiac is it's not really managed by a doctor once it's caught. Because if you have an extreme restriction of gluten, then you heal and you get better and you're not having these flares. And if you do get glutened, well, then you're going to have a lot of GI distress and impact. But in the process of getting sick, as many people that are going to get even referred to GI as a specialty, you're probably having either upper or lower or both GI symptoms. And so some of the things are going to be really knowledgeable. I found for GI in terms of like celiac, just as one example, they don't really have a lot to do because it's not medically managed. They catch it, you change your diet, and that resolves a lot. And so in terms of just having that understanding, because certainly there's a lot of GI symptoms that can come along if you've been glutened or if you're undiagnosed as a celiac. And so just even understanding the relationship of how autoimmune diseases, how OCD, how these vulnerabilities really are more related. And you can't deny if you're looking at 15 to 30 percent of people exhibiting the IBS criterion, that's a large chunk. Like you got to go. That's more than a coincidence. Exactly. So this is a great place to talk about the difference between IBS and other disorders of digestion, including celiac disease and inflammatory bowel diseases, which include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Because there's a lot of overlap between all of these, but there are some really important distinctions to understand as well. So first, you've already hinted at, yes, absolutely. There is a huge connection between OCD and vulnerability to autoimmune disorders. And that's been known for a long time. But interestingly, most of the research has been by immunologists, rheumatologists, people who don't actually have a lot of expertise in OCD. So they'll be starting with a population of autoimmune patients and they'll be asking, okay, well, you know, can can we see some links to OCD? And epidemiologically, yep, you sure can. And so they just say, well, I guess OCD is an autoimmune disorder. And when you actually read the fine print in those studies... (laughs) They often measured OCD in an extremely simplistic and naive way. And so a few years ago, I did a study, which I will freely admit we haven't actually gotten around to publishing yet, but I intend to because it's such a cool finding where we actually got a whole lot of people to share with us much, much more detail about the nature of the obsessions and particularly the compulsions that they engaged in. And it turns out that in families where one member has a lot of contamination obsessions and cleaning compulsions, it turns out those are the families where you also tend to see the autoimmune disorders arising, which really gets back to the hygiene hypothesis of autoimmune disorders. And that if you don't have enough exposure early in life to the range of pathogens and things in the world, your immune system kind of gets dumb And unfortunately, it doesn't know the difference anymore between self and other. And so you see more allergies, more asthma, more celiac disease, more inflammatory bowel disease in those folks. Yeah. So that's a really interesting connection just right there. Right. But then that gets complicated, of course, because for celiac disease, of course, you're exactly right. The intervention is gluten restriction, Mm -hmm. strict gluten restriction. So yeah, you're really not going to work with a GI doc. Hopefully you're going to work with a really good registered dietitian who has expertise in celiac management. And you're going to help out a plan for yourself and it's going to work and it's going to keep you really healthy moving forward. Exactly. Inflammatory bowel diseases, however, they do need to be managed medically and they're generally treated with immune suppressing medications of various kinds, which means that, of course, people are going to be more vulnerable to things like upper respiratory infection. Right. So it's not uncommon to see somebody with Crohn's disease who's on an immune suppressing medication 
who may have had some OCD to begin with, now become even more frantic about protecting themselves from illness and contamination. Right. So that's complicated. And that may even be encouraged by their gastroenterologist who says, oh yeah, well, you're really vulnerable to infection, so you need to be more careful. And boy, then the hand sanitizer and the gloves and the masks and things come out and, and people can get very frantic about that. And then a final piece in this OLAP is that folks with other kinds of GI disorders like celiac and inflammatory bowel diseases are also very vulnerable to secondary irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. So irritable bowel syndrome is not really a biological diagnosis. Right. IBF is really a disorder of gut-brain interaction. This is where we start to see the obsessional focus. And this is where we start to see anxiety and catastrophizing and rumination coming out, where people who might have some underlying GI distress can really start to get very, very, very anxious. And that can fuel a whole positive feedback loop where the more anxious and distressed you get, the more upset your gut gets, the more upset your gut gets, the more anxious and distressed you get. Yeah. So there's a lot of overlap in all kinds of directions between all of these different disorders. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because as you were talking, I was like, yes, this makes total sense. And it also makes sense why someone that say they're in cancer treatment or remission, but they have to be very cautious of their neutrophils. And, and those would be the white blood cells. If I remember correctly, my father-in-law deals with this a lot, has to get IVIG for it. But neutrophils are, I believe, the white blood cells that help fight infection and help with all of that. So if you are immune suppressed, whether biologically by an autoimmune or even by proxy of different medical procedures or things that you've been fighting in your life in terms of medical treatments, that can make a huge impact. And like you're saying here, then for IBD, if you're taking immune suppressing meds, then it also is reinforcing the problem a little bit in terms of just the concerns around if I do get contaminated, it could be really bad because I'm not going to really be able to fight it. That kind of thinking. Exactly. So are you finding too for patients, whether it's an organic autoimmune or if it's something that's secondary because of a medication being taken, we're more likely to see the show up in a similar way? Well, I think what we see is that there's a lot of danger for comorbidity around all of these issues, yeah. right? And, it, you know, it shows up, it manifests a little bit differently in every different patient. But I do see it in my IBS patients as well, where they'll be terribly, terribly afraid of picking up a stomach bug of some kind, right? Picking yep. up gastroenteritis because they're so terrified of it exacerbating their underlying GI conditions. And so you'll see people engaging in all kinds of what we really think of as maladaptive avoidance that's very similar to what somebody with OCD with contamination fears might engage in. Right. And oftentimes we are having to draw a fine line. And of course, during the pandemic, this was even more complicated, right? Right. Of drawing that fine line between appropriate infection control and caution in the world Versus what starts to veer into compulsions and anxiety about exposure and becomes really maladaptive avoidance and safety utilization behaviors. So it's really a tough call with every individual patient. Yeah, and I, I can vouch even from being in the celiac support community, there is a lot of reinforced fear, too. Because it would be wonderful if it was as easy as, I'm not going to eat flour products or barley or anything of that nature. Because cross-contamination, any kind of part per million of ingestion of gluten protein can make you very, very ill. But you see some of those same behaviors start to manifest there. And then you go, I'm so anal retentive. I'm so cautious. I'm so compulsive around making sure that I'm not actually exposed to the gluten protein that you can really see this rise in feeling distressed to the point of people going, well, am I actually gluten or am I just upset because I'm so stressed about this? That exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You've pointed out something incredibly important which is that the gut and the brain are tied together really closely. 
In fact, there are some physicians who say that you have a brain in your gut. It's called the enteric nervous system. It's not something that we hear about much. We hear about the sympathetic nervous system and sometimes the parasympathetic nervous system or the central nervous system. We don't really hear very much about the enteric nervous system, but it's really important. It's the system of nerves that, that enervate the entire digestive tract. And it's really tightly tied to the central nervous system so that when we get stressed or anxious about anything, it will have an immediate effect on various aspects of the digestive system. So for example, people feel very dry mouth when they're scared or they feel a lump in their throat, or they feel a knot in their stomach, right. or right. they feel like they've been punched in the gut. Mm -hmm. Think about all these expressions that we have in our language to convey, right? I had a lump in my throat. I had a knot in my stomach. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. These are all ways of saying I was upset or frightened right. about something. Right. There's a reason we have all those digestive metaphors for fear and distress and anxiety. And it's because stress and anxiety have an immediate biological impact on the functioning of the digestive system. So one of my favorite little fun facts about this is that, you know, we all know that cortisol is one of the major stress hormones right. when we're upset, right? Well, cortisol, it's a complex signaling system, but it involves corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH. Well, guess where we have a ton of CRH receptors in the wall of the gut? There's so much going on in the gut. <laughs> There's so much going on in there, which means that when we get anxious, right? So if you have celiac disease and you've been out to eat or you've eaten at a friend's house and you're not maybe feeling great after the meal and you start thinking, oh my gosh, have I been glutened? What? Oh no, what's happening in there? Like, this is terrible. And you start to get anxious and upset and frustrated with yourself and angry and all kinds of things, that distress in and of itself can cause substantial GI discomfort and pain. Yeah. And so you may not have been glutened, right? It could just be that it's the anxiety about the possibility that's actually leading to the symptoms. Yeah. And to be very clear, that does not mean it's all in your head. Right. It is discomfort is actually in your gut. It hurts. Yeah. It's, it's not fun. It right. It absolutely hurts. So it's not all in your head, but it is being controlled by your brain. Yeah. And you know, at a certain point, you know, if you were or you weren't because glutenine is not, it may come on subtly. It comes on in different ways for different people, but it screams at you and it's there and you're like, oh no, that's clearly glutenine versus something else. But yeah, you're right. And you can see the echo chamber of how this kind of group fear manifests, even when, you, you know, the support group that's supposed to be like, you got this, <laughs> is often a place where like fears are just held and everyone's like, well, I didn't even think about that. And so it can become quite this distressing area. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And it is a really interesting thing to consider how that impacts. And I wonder even like, say for kiddos, when we're starting to see this emerge, even at early ages, we can see OCD and other mental health presentations start at early ages. We certainly can see autoimmune, especially if you have a family history of it or medical complications happen at early ages. And I wonder, I mean, I'd imagine it's hard to know, but is there some pediatric literature out there that talks about that younger subset how that tends to affect kiddos? Well, so tummy pain is the single most common reason for school refusal in little kiddos. We know that. And partly the reason for that, I think, is that it's really hard for a parent. If the kid wakes up and says, oh, mom, my stomach hurts, right? Right. The parent can take your temperature and say, well, you don't have a fever. But the parent can't say, no, your stomach doesn't hurt. Right. They should be validating in that way. So for kids who are anxious, for kids who are developing certain kinds of rituals or avoidance things, for kids who are starting to get worried about things. Right. Complaining about tummy pain is often a great way to enable avoidance. So that becomes a problem. And then sometimes it almost becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, right. which can be a problem too, right? And then they really do start to develop tummy pain. And it gets reinforced by parents who then allow them to stay home. That was, I was just going to say that reinforcement. And actually, we've just talked about school refusal including that. And so mm -hmm. I can even reference back, fam, if you didn't catch the episode on school refusal, 
we were talking about this piece as well and why it's important to be able to reach out and rule out something like that with the doctor. Because there very well may be, as you're speaking to Melissa in this comorbidity, the anxiety, but also at what point in that, and it's going to range too for us as people, and there's going to be different genetic predispositions, environmental predispositions, and things of that order, how important it is to get that evaluation and go, is there something more to this that we're having these IBS symptoms, especially if we're at this point where it is reinforcing it? And you're having legit medical issues here with your GI tract. So that is such an important point. And I think that is really, really helpful. So there's so much we're going to cover. And I'm going to move us on into this next area. But this is just so fascinating. And I, I hope, fam, that this is also helpful and enlightening in terms of considering you or your loved one and what's going on within your family. But what we want to move into talking about is how OCD often involves health anxiety. And we're talking a little bit about that already in terms of people that have autoimmune or autosuppressed immune systems. But we're going to talk about how OCD often involves this health anxiety and obsessive focus on the aspects of health and the physical body that aren't working right. This is particularly noticeable in folks that are dealing with constipation, which I don't remember if we said it when we were recording or before but is a predominant symptom of IBS. And so I would love if we could talk more about how the progression of, say, even toileting compulsions around, I'm afraid I'm going to have pain, dealing with this constipation. I've seen this in kids and adults and would love to hear more about your thoughts on this. Absolutely. So the first thing to say is something everyone in your audience knows all too well which is that OCD is an incredibly opportunistic disorder, right? Right. It is going to grab on and sink its claws into whatever feels important or salient or upsetting to you. Right. So whatever has high emotional value to you in some way or another, those are exactly the things that OCD tends to try to grab onto and twist. Mm -hmm. So... If you are having any issues around elimination, around pooping, around abdominal pain, around reactivity to food, boy, you can pretty much guarantee that the OCD is going to notice and go off ah, and it's going to sink its claws into it. There are lots and lots of different ways that can manifest. So, for example, people with either IBS with primary constipation, IBSD, which is primary diarrhea or IBS-M, which is an alternating mix of the two. Many of those folks who also have OCD will become really obsessively worried about what's going on in their body. Yeah. They are constantly wondering, maybe the doctor missed something. Maybe this is really cancer. Something is really wrong. This is really upsetting. People will have these sort of perfectionistic rituals. They think they should poop every day at exactly 730 in the morning, one time a day, right? Right. And for people with OCD, yes, that often doesn't happen. Sometimes you don't poop for a day or sometimes you'll poop two or three times a day. Right. All of which is actually within the range of normal functioning to the gastrointestinal system. But for people with OCD who want it to be just right and who want to be sure that they've taken care of their need to, to poop before they leave the house, for example, in the morning, they can often develop pretty significant rituals around Toileting. And if they haven't sort of nailed it in any given morning, it can be extremely anxiety provoking. Right. So it's a combination of kind of obsessions and rumination about health and whether your body is doing the things that it should be doing. And people can develop some real compulsions around the need to toilet. Right. Effectively, right. In on a schedule, sort of in the same way. And the body doesn't always work that way. So that can be super frustrating for people. Yeah, that's such a great point. I'm thinking of a client, but I'm also thinking just in general, I have a privilege of working with many autistic clients. All three of my children are autistic. And so I have a lot of lived experience about neurodiversity in that way. And one of the things that comes up often, and not always, but often within the autistic community, and it can show up in other presentations and, and holistic folks as well, 
is sometimes really a struggle with understanding their interoceptive cueing. And so if you already are experiencing physical pain, which anybody who's ever had constipation, <laughs> whether it's a chronic condition or not, you're like, that's unpleasant. You could have more gas and bloating. You could feel physical pain in your stomach. You also could have physical pain trying to actually use the bathroom and trying to poop out whatever this mass is, right? And so it can add a lot of distress. It can put you at risk, which I know we have in the notes here too, but certainly can put you at risk for anal fissures and different things of that sort. But if you are already sensitive or struggle with reading that interoceptive cueing, and then you do feel the pain, and then you do end up having more of this negative experience anytime you need to go to the bathroom, then you are more likely to either avoid foods at all because that's going to make you need to poop or maybe even running around your colon gets going and you're like, I don't want to have to poop. Whether you understand the connection of why or not, you can easily start to develop some of these safety behaviors, some of these compulsions where you go, well, this is a really negative experience for me and I'm feeling anxious about even thinking about doing it. And so that can really cluster. And I would imagine you don't have to be autistic to be feeling the distress around chronic IBSC where you're having chronic constipation. But I imagine too, even for our neurodivergent folks, that can get even more complicated. And then in terms of what sensory strategies are going to make me feel better and what if, if I'm having these different sensations and I'm scanning my body and feeling already this hypervigilant about health, I might really get freaked out at that point because it's hard to decipher. It can be hard to decipher for anyone, but particularly it can be a challenge within autistic folks. And so I don't know how much research that you would have that per pertains specifically to neurodivergent communities, but in terms of those interoceptive struggles, I can only imagine how much that would compound a situation like this where you're already developing some obsessional fear and compulsive practices around toileting and things of that nature. So believe it or not, this is not at all limited to the neurodivergent folks. In fact, you're touching on a really important component of IBS, which is called visceral hypersensitivity. Mm -hmm. And this happens in pretty much everyone with IBS, whether they're neurotypical or neurodivergent, that once you start focusing on and getting concerned about sensations inside your abdomen, you start paying more attention to them. You yeah. start skipping for them. You start to get more worried about them. And as soon as you start scanning something and paying attention to it a lot, well, guess what? You notice it more. And then once you notice it more, you start to pay more attention to it and you get even more worried about it. And so we see this kind of escalating cycle of basically benign sensations that most people maybe wouldn't even notice. Right. Like most people can't feel peristalsis, right? Which is the rhythmic contractions of the gut as it moves food waste through. Most people don't feel little gas bubbles working their way through. But if you start obsessively focusing on that, you're going to feel everything. Right. And it actually turns the volume up on pain signaling. Yeah. So not to be too technical, but there is something called the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, which is sort of one of the last parts of the spinal cord where a lot of the enteric nervous system sends its information up to the brain through that pathway. And there's a certain gate in that part of the spinal cord that is supposed to help filter out all the sensations that we don't really need to pay attention to, right? All the normal peristalsis, gas, stuff like that. Yeah. In IBS, that gate gets thrown wide open and we start to feel everything. And not only are we feeling it, but it feels painful. It's not just uncomfortable. It can actually be painful. And then all of that information is getting rushed up to the brain and the brain's going, oh no, oh no, something's wrong. I better pay more attention. I better do something to solve this. We better take care of this. We better worry about this. And of course, the more you do that, the stronger and more intense the signaling becomes. So it's a really unfortunate positive feedback loop. Right. It's entirely like some of the positive feedback loops we see in OCD, where the more you worry about it and pay attention to it, the more worrisome it becomes. And people think that they're going to solve the problem by paying attention to it. But really, it just tends to make it worse, unfortunately. Yeah, that's such a great point. 
so since there is really that sensitivity, like you said, visceral hypersensitivity, Mm -hmm. in terms of how do folks tend to manage that? Is it a combined approach between working with that good GI or doctor that you hopefully are established with and working with a therapist on some of those reinforcing thought loops that mirror and may be also inclusive of OCD? Or what strategies for family members going, oh, yeah, for sure. Because within health anxiety, I mean, we talk about it in the OCD field a lot, too. If you're going to focus on it, yeah, of course you're going to feel it. And you were talking about that as well. And so what do you find? Do you find there's certain medications that can help with that neural sensitivity? Is there a combination of different therapeutic strategies that tend to help? Or does it kind of just depend on the person and what is going to work in that individualized care plan? So it's always going to depend to some extent on the person, but I can give you some kind of overarching answers to that. And for the OCD fam out there, this is not going to be surprising. Cognitive behavioral therapy, decatastrophizing, and everybody's favorite, exposure therapy is what tends to work through this. So unfortunately, what people often do is they start to engage in a lot of safety utilization behaviors. And those behaviors can look very different across different patients, depending on what the fear is. So for example, somebody who is extremely anxious about the possibility of experiencing fecal incontinence, having an accident, that's something we haven't talked about much yet, but that is a huge fear for many people with IBS. Right. They worry about actually losing control of their bowels when they're out in public and pooping their pants. Right. And this is terrifying to many, many people. Right. So people will develop all kinds of avoidance and safety behaviors around preventing that possibility. So rituals in the morning to try to make sure they're cleaned out, not eating. That's another thing, of course, people do. And importantly, scoping out bathrooms, trying to figure out exactly where bathrooms are. Now, of course, if you have contamination fears of in public restrooms, that can be even more complicated. But for many people, knowing where there's a public restroom feels very reassuring. Right. People also engage in all kinds of compulsive avoidance or management of food and diet. Right. To the point where it sometimes looks so complex or so rigid that you wonder how they're getting decent nutrition at all. Right. And that's also very common in folks with OCD who are sometimes picky eaters, especially if they're neurodivergent or on the spectrum, where you will see very picky eating, but also what is called fear-based food avoidance. So ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, can either be extreme picky eating where people just don't like the foods, Mm -hmm. or it can be fear-based, where you're terribly afraid that eating this food is going to cause all kinds of uncomfortable GI sensations up to and including urgent, crampy diarrhea and maybe incontinence. People worry about that a lot. And so they develop all kinds of restrictive eating to try to manage that. Yeah. Well, that's not a great outcome. Like those are the things we don't want people doing, right? We want people to be able to live their lives fully, eat as unrestricted a diet as possible and, you know, just live a full, healthy life. Yeah. So when we have people who are engaging in all these avoidance behaviors, First of all, I should point out, unfortunately, gastroenterologists really have very little to offer folks. IBS does not respond very well to traditional medical management. Now, that's very different from inflammatory bowel diseases, where you absolutely have to be working ongoing with a good gastroenterologist who's going to help you medically manage the disease. Right. But in the case of IBS, traditional gastroenterology really has very, very little to do that's helpful. Same with celiac, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. It is interesting. And sometimes I share these personal examples if I think they can be helpful for the family, kind of putting some of this into context. So I think this certainly happened with my middle kiddo when he was around, I don't know, 18, 19 months. We were traveling and we took, I wouldn't say obsessive, I would say we took normative cleaning procedures. We were traveling through an airport. If you're using a changing table, they can be gross. So it's okay to get that prepped. But still, Once we got home from that trip, he was so, so, so ill. And it turned out that he had somewhere picked up C. diff. I don't know, but I can suspect or hypothesize that may have come from airport changing table. I can't know for sure. 
But what I will say is he was a great eater. He is autistic as well. But at that time, we didn't necessarily have that on the radar. And he was a great eater. And he went to needing absolutely nothing. Because for anyone knowledgeable about C. diff, I'm sorry. I just, I'm sorry in advance. It's an awful, awful virus. I don't even remember. So maybe that's part of my own healing. It's a, it's a, bac- it's a bacterium. It's I, know, a- I know a lot about C. diff. Yes. I- yeah. And so he <laughs> didn't want to eat. First of all, the medicine that you have to take for it is awful. So trying to force that. And there's really no choice that has to go through the gut. And so trying to force this kid that is not going to get better if he doesn't have, I mean, we were on the verge of fecal implants at this point because it was so hard for him to ingest it. So the medicine is already bad enough. And then he was like, screw this food. If I eat, then I get sick on it. I'm not going to eat. And he's 18 months. You can't bargain with him. There are things that you can't do. You can't make a kid poop. You can't make a kid eat. They have to choose that. And so it's a good way of being able to conceptualize how things can change in an ARFID type situation where that food avoidance or for older folks, too, it can be like caffeine and coffee is a diuretic. So I'm not going to have coffee at all or any kind of caffeine if that might trigger. It can start small and really start to expand to the point that your food, your preferred food list or foods that you might cycle through and jag occasionally ends up getting pretty small and it's hard to get nutrition then at that point and so it sounds like you yes have a lot of experience i'm sure around c diff and so would love to kind of hear your thoughts on that as well absolutely so c diff cell is a bacterium almost everybody has some c diff in their gut we're pretty much all colonized with it to some degree or another but this is going to get us into a really fascinating topic which is the human microbiome Yes. You've been seeing a lot about this in the news these days. Yeah. So we are hosts to hundreds of millions of bacteria in and around and on our bodies, most of which actually live in our gut. Now, for anybody with OCD who's totally creeped out by that, here's what you have to understand. These are mostly symbiotic bacteria. That means that we live with them very happily, and it is mutually beneficial for both the host and the bacteria. So it's good for us and it's good for the bacteria. Right. It's positive. It is a positive thing. That's right. That's our microbiome. It's this whole complicated like rainforest ecology of different microorganisms, including bacteria and fungi and all kinds of things that live in our gut. Right. They actually are really important for good health. First of all, they help us digest our food. We need them to digest lots of different, what are all the prebiotic food. They also interact with our immune system. They interact with our mood. They help control obesity. These bacteria turn out to be so incredibly important. And what we really need is a balanced ecosystem of lots and lots of different bacteria in our gut. When you have a balanced ecosystem, All the other bacteria help keep the C. diff bacteria and the E. coli bacteria, for that matter, in check, okay? But here's what happens with a lot of folks who grow up in Western countries, and in particular, Western countries that put a lot of emphasis on cleaning and decontaminating and sterilizing. Unfortunately, most Westerners end up with what is called an impoverished microbiome. We don't actually have a healthy set, lots of different bacteria living in our gut. So some of the folks in your fam here might recall that it wasn't that long ago that the FDA banned a particular antimicrobial product called triclosan, which had been appearing in like every household product ever. They were impregnating cutting boards with it. They were putting it in every kind of hand soap. And the FDA said, you know what? Actually, we're going to be on this because it turns out it's terrible for public health. Yeah. Because what you end up with is people who are way more vulnerable to resistant infections like MRSA and C. diff. So folks in the fam, all those cleaning compulsions are actually making you more vulnerable to a very serious intestinal bacterial infection. 
it seems so counterintuitive, right. but it's so important to understand. If we have a whole bunch of different species in there and we're constantly replenishing our microbiome in good and healthy and appropriate ways, then the C. diff is kept in check by everything else. So imagine that C. diff were like white deer. Well, white deer in the suburbs become a real menace, become a hazard. They just breathe. They take over everything. They eat all your tulips. They cause car accidents. Why? Because we don't have wolves and mountain lions and mule deer and elk and moose to compete with them, right? When you have a, a sort of monoculture, that one critter just grows out of control. Whereas when you have a balanced ecosystem, that one critter, C. diff in our case, is kept in check. That's really interesting. So something like, and you said, was it Triclosin, is that what you call it? Triclosin was, a, was an antimicrobial agent that for about 10 years started popping up in all kinds of household products. And the FDA finally banned it. Like you couldn't buy hand soap without, without it. Without Triclosin. It's interesting. I tend to think in analogies. So I throw them out there sometimes. They don't all stick. It's not, they're not all winners. But you tell me if this kind of would make sense. When I conceptualize something like a chemo treatment, Part of what's hard about it is it's going to take everything out, although chemo is more of a poison, right? But it's going to take out all the bad, hopefully, but it also takes out all the good that can fight against exactly. that. And so similarly, triclosan in that situation is not only taking out bad gut stuff, perhaps, but good gut stuff and an imbalance then can quickly be related. I kind of wonder, too, and maybe it's not, but yeast in Canada sometimes that can run rampant. I think this also can sometimes be part of the problem, right? Where it's the That's exactly right. That's why women often get yeast infections when they take antibiotics. Yeah. Right? Because when you disturb the overall ecology of that system, other individual species can run rampant. Now you said something really interesting about your son that I want to circle back to because I think it's such a weird thing and it's important for folks to understand it. Sure. You mentioned that you were thinking about a fecal transplant. Right? Yeah. So for folks who don't know, SMT, also known as fecal microbial transplantation, in about five to seven years is probably going to be the frontline treatment for C. diff infection. Mm -hmm. It isn't quite yet, but it's around the corner. We are going to stop treating C. diff infections with massive nuclear powered broad spectrum antibiotics. And we're going to start treating it with FMT. Now, in FMT, what you do is you take fecal microbiome colonies from a healthy person and you give it to the sick person. And what it does is it reestablishes the ecology of the healthy microbiome. The reality is with antibiotic treatment, C. diff is extremely likely to recur twice three times, even four times. Yeah. And right now, FMT is only available for folks who have failed multiple rounds of antibiotic treatment. But typically, a single round of FMT cures C. diff. So for anyone out there who's feeling super squirmy and uncomfortable and that OCD is kicking you around right now because you're like, ew, gross. You're like other poop with my poop. I don't like it. Oh, it sounds horrible, right? But, yeah. but this is one of the most important things. You know, when I treat folks with OCD, I tell them to throw out their hand sanitizer. Stop using it. You want your microbiome to be as diverse and robust as possible. And it's such an important part of preventing the onset GI disorders right. like C. diff, like IBS. We really want our microbiome to be as diverse as possible. And that means we have to pick up microbes from the world around us. And the only way to do that is to touch stuff right, and breathe stuff and let it into your body. And believe it or not, that's good for your digestive health long-term. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not uncommon in other areas of medicine either. For example, my brother-in-law is a bone marrow transplant hematologist, and he will take bone marrow and implant it into a cancer patient, say a leukemia patient, right? And 
the thought is very similar, at least from my layman understanding of it. So I won't, I'm not a doctor. I'll just you know, remind everyone I'm not a medical doctor. But the idea is if someone has a functioning immune system that's able to fight and we have certain cells that are taking over similar to the biome situation in the gut, then if we have a good ecology, a good system implanted in there, now the hope is this will help take over the wreckage that is happening internally in the example of the fecal implant. And again, with probiotics or prebiotics, you may be more familiar if you're like, what's a microbiome? But everything has probiotics almost, right? The yogurt with probiotics, this has probiotics. And so, yeah, even naturally fermented foods, whether you think you're getting probiotics or not, these things, what we're learning is, is really, really helpful for the gut health. So something for me, when I found out I had a celiac, something for my son when he was dealing with the treachery of a C. diff infection was we don't necessarily have research on which or how much and all these different things. Doctors will often say we find it helps. <laughs> and it does because we know that the overpopulation in the other direction leads to pure misery and is not helpful. And so in terms of rebalancing the gut, it sounds gross. And I freaked out as a parent, I will admit. At first, I was like, poop. And I was probably a little more concerned even about him having to go under general anesthesia because that is not a preferred thing for kids. <laughs> like, no one's sitting there enjoying it, per se. But for kids, they can have a really hard time adjusting in and out of general anesthesia. And so fecal implants sounds a lot scarier. And we're not saying if you have IBS or <laughs> if you get C. diff, although it sounds like that will change. And wouldn't that be better? You don't have to take that medicine very often, even as an adult, to go, this is awful, and you feel awful, and if something could take it away in one procedure, please, please. It's a, it, it is awful, and, and I can only imagine for MRSA patients as well. Exactly. So, you know, the, the point that I would love your listeners to take away from this is that the modern pathogen theory of medicine, right, which is that viruses and bacteria make us sick, it was an incredibly important paradigm shift, right? It, it allowed us to control cholera and typhoid fever and all of these other food and waterborne illnesses. Like, I mean, we invented vaccines. It was a total game changer in terms of our understanding of how to protect health. And I think a lot of folks with OCD grab onto that and they think, well, okay, so what I really need to do is sterilize things. Like I, I need to make my environment as clean as I possibly can. And that's very consistent with that sort of germ theory of modern medicine. Unfortunately, we took it too far and we didn't understand the importance of the symbiotic bacteria and fungi and yeast and things that live in and on our bodies and actually help protect us and maintain good health. Right. One gastroenterologist I worked with, who I thought said something really lovely, said, it's a thin line between dying of cholera and developing Crohn's, oh. which is not a women disorder, right? Yeah. So this is the conundrum that so many folks with OCD face, right? That, well, my therapist is telling me that I have to do all this exposure therapy, and I have to go ahead and touch things and touch my face and maybe even put my fingers in my mouth. And they're telling me I have to rub my shoe on my head. Like, this is crazy. Why would I do this? People don't normally do this. And the answer is it's because we're trying to help you get back to a place where you can be in that middle ground, right? Where you can be right in that place between over sterilizing your environment versus really exposing yourself to something that might make you truly sick. And what it turns out is that generally speaking, more exposure is better. Yeah. Which is what we find with general like immune system knowledge, right? Like if we can fight infection, if our body learns how to adapt to this, then if we encounter that again in the environment, our body already knows how to handle that. And so that exposure, it's why little babies are going to be a lot more sensitive to catching things. Something you were saying when you said sterilization, I'm not sure if this is an equivalent parallel, but it made me think, I feel like all the rage, at least in the last couple of years around the area where I'm living, is this idea of elimination diets. And oh my goodness, sometimes it's GI, sometimes it's eczema, sometimes it's different reactions, headaches, and just feeling bloated and blah. 
which again bloated, we could draw back down to GI. But people are very quick, which I think actually going through even the celiac journey, you can't be tested for celiac if you've already gone gluten free because your body won't show the amount of damage that confirms or the celiac sprue or whatever they are looking for. The blunted villi, which we were talking about digestion of food earlier, and that is part of how the food moves through, as well as how we are able to absorb nutrients from our food. So as someone with celiac, I can say, before I knew gluten was the problem, I stopped being able to process lactose. It's not that surprising when we learn that I blunted villi that we're not able to absorb that well, and it in and of itself was causing distress. I feel like people, in, you were talking about the visceral hypersensitivity earlier, people will go, I kind of feel this upset stomach. Maybe, what if it's the legumes? What if it's the, and I think, please know, I'm not saying that people don't actually have food sensitivities and the, those aren't real, but sometimes people are very, very quick before even going to a doctor to eliminate sometimes dramatic amounts of food. That even if you aren't having inflammation directly because of food, when you start to integrate it back in, your body is in such shock that it's like, Bleh, I don't know how to process all of this. And so it's different than contamination, but I feel like it functions similarly. It absolutely does. And people even talk about their food being contaminated with triggers. So lots of folks with IBS will start eliminating huge numbers of different food groups. And then they worry a lot about the possibility that they're, if they eat out, especially if their food has been contaminated, they will use that language right. with something that they believe that they're sensitive to. And I think you've hit on something incredibly important here. I am not a fan of restrictive and elimination diets unless they are actually medically warranted. So if you have celiac disease, you absolutely need to be gluten-free. 100% I agree with that entirely, obviously. On the other hand, lots of people avoid gluten because they think they're sensitive to it, but they're not. If you are actually lactose intolerant, what does that actually mean? Well, lactose intolerance means that you do not produce enough of the enzyme lactase, which breaks lactose down before it hits the small intestine. And so once it gets into the intestine, it gets fermented by symbiotic bacteria and causes gas and water and discomfort. But if you have lactase in your body, the lactase breaks down the lactose before it has the opportunity to be fermented. About half the world's population is lactose tolerant. That is to say, they continue to produce lactase after about age two or three. We all are born with lactase, by the way, or the species would have died out because we needed to digest human breast milk. But for many people, that gene sort of gets switched off around age two or three, and then they become lactose intolerant. But many people, about half the world's population, are lactose tolerant and can drink cow and sheep and goat and even yak milk perfectly. So if you're actually lactose intolerant, by all means, use lactate products or take a lactate pill. The lactate pill contains lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. But so many people with digestive issues become terrified food. And this gets us back to that ARFID diagnosis, right? right? And unfortunately, a lot of gastroenterologists kind of aid and abet this. They say, well, why don't you try eliminating dairy? Yes. Or why don't you try eliminating gluten? Or the worst advice of all is here, try the low FODMAP diet. Yes. yes. We got to talk about the low FODMAP diet for a minute. So the low FODMAP diet is sort of, I like to think of it as the mother of all avoidance strategies. Yes. The low FODMAP diet eliminates so many different foods and food groups. It is extremely hard to follow. It's very hard to get good nutrition on it. It's very meat heavy. It's very fiber light. Mm -hmm. uh, and it literally eliminates every single prebiotic food. Right. Well, hold on, folks. Remember how we've been talking about how important the microbiome is? Yeah. If you eliminate all the prebiotic foods, those are the foods that nourish the bacteria that live in our gut, those bacteria start to die. Right. So if you're on the low FODMAP diet for too long, you actually end up with worse and worse and worse dysbiosis or the ecology of those symbiotic bacteria gets more and more and more out of whack. Yeah. So that's a huge problem. So the low FODMAP diet eliminates dairy. It eliminates a lot of the, the grains, including wheat. 
But to be clear, it does not eliminate wheat because of the gluten. It eliminates wheat because of a carbohydrate called a fructate. It also eliminates all the legumes, every single one, every bean, all soy, chickpeas, lentils, you name it. If it's a legume, you can't eat it. So basically, it's possible to be a vegetarian on this diet because, you know, all your complete protein sources are gone. It also eliminates a lot of fruits and vegetables. So all the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage, and kale, and collard, yep, they're gone. Brussels sprouts, all out. And it eliminates a lot of fruits. So apples, not allowed to eat apples anymore. All of the stone fruits, so anything that has a pit, a peach, a plum, a cherry, even an avocado is considered a stone fruit. Mushrooms are gone. Asparagus is gone. And here's the real killer. Onions and garlic. God, don't eat. This is a terribly restrictive diet. It's extremely hard to stick to. And it worsens dysbiosis. And a lot of folks who start to follow this diet become really obsessive about worrying about reintroducing foods. And Nicole, you were exactly right. If you stop eating a food for a while, the body adjusts. And for example, it stops producing the enzymes that you need to break down some of those molecules. Yeah. So then when you do go back to reintroduce the food, yeah, you're going to feel symptomatic. Of course, of course you are. But again, guess what, folks? Exposure therapy is always the way to go. If you keep exposing yourself to it, eventually your body will start to reproduce those enzymes. Those bacterial colonies will bounce back and then you will be able to digest the food again. Yeah, and it's interesting because similar to OCD, so fam that's been with us for a while, you're going to be real familiar with this, but similar to when we're going through that process, we have a tendency to attribute so much value and meaning to a feeling of distress. And I think because so many anxiety symptoms can be felt in a somatic manner, so we can feel some of those pains, that we go, oh, well, I ate this and immediately I felt bloated and that was uncomfortable. And so that means it's bad. But also, like you're saying, if your body's lost its ability to process it because we don't have that ecosystem in the gut anymore, then that doesn't mean that it's bad. That means your gut is compromised to not be able to take in these different foods or these different proteins and enzymes, etc. And another one, when you were talking about low FODMAP, the AIP diet, this is an autoimmune protocol diet that is intensely restrictive, intensely, intensely restrictive. And as we talked at the top of the show, autoimmune diseases, we can already be predispositioned to already be functioning in the more compulsive way around how we're eating and also how our cleaning or whatnot can contribute to our immune system not being up to snuff with a lot of the different things we experience in our environment. And so you take someone with an autoimmune disease, and I don't mean to laugh, guys, but it's just like the irony of it, and then add an AIP diet. I mean, you're really, really going to struggle, and your world is going to get very, very small. Exactly right. Because once you start avoiding food, that means you're also going to be compromised in your ability to socialize and spend time with loved ones and even work events. Because think about how many of those events in our lives revolve around food and drink and shared meals. Yeah. Not to mention the importance of culture and joy and family traditions that when you start eating an incredibly restrictive diet, your life gets really small really quickly and it's not much fun. So, you know, I really want to encourage people. And again, I know your audience has heard this a million times, but folks, exposure, exposure, exposure. Yeah. Because the more broad your microbiome is, the more diverse your microbiome is, the more diversity of healthful foods you eat, all of these things are going to help ensure better digestive health long term. Yeah, and this is partly why any of the fam out there that have recently had children, it's been at least, I feel like I felt the shift at least where I'm living eight to 10 years here because I feel like uh, the messaging was a little different even between my oldest, who is 10, and my middle child, who is eight. 
And it was around allergies, right? Because suddenly the world had so many more allergies. And you were talking about that earlier with the development of asthma and other allergies if you're not having mm-hmm. exposure. And so where you may start feeding a child at six months, introducing them to different solid foods, they were saying, let's introduce them at four months and let's introduce them to peanut butter. Let's introduce them to these different things. And you water it down. You can mix it with a formula or breast milk. And you're obviously not going to give a four-month-old some tacky peanut butter to choke on. But what I will say is, especially as we've seen the proliferation of peanut allergies and other things, and as we look cross-culturally, so within different cultures, depending on where you are in the world, the harvest and the food that grows well in your environment and what you have the most access to, you're probably going to be able to digest more robustly than if you go and travel to another area where you didn't have a lot of milk, maybe outside of breastfeeding or things like that. It's going to be harder for you to be able to break it down. And so what you're saying is not even in in the sense of exposure therapy, certainly the exposure therapy can be helpful. But if we just think more broadly, exposure to the environment, to the foods, to trying things. And much like a kid learning to eat, when they have a food the first time, they might be like, blah. And there's statistics out there. I can't tell you the perfect number off the top of my head, but you may have to introduce maybe 15, 20 times. I'll look it up, fam, and I'll cite it over on the blog so that you're not going off of speculation because I'm not a fan of just armchairing that. Uh, but I will give you the, the statistic over on the blog. Uh, But that general exposure makes a difference. And you might still have an allergy. I can think of my nephew who is sensitive to peanut butter, and they did not realize it until my in-laws were over, and we had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on gluten-free bread. Yes, we did. Okay. And so we were having lunch, and he started to break out into hives. But interestingly enough, he was fairly young at the time, three or somewhere in that range. But the doctor actually said, I want you to continue exposing him to small bits of peanuts, even though this is not a a positive reaction because this will only get worse or more severe and get to that point where it could be as many people living with the fear around peanut allergies. Yes, that can be a life-threatening condition. And so actually where our intuition would say, we should not eat peanuts, that happened and it could get worse. It's actually we should eat peanuts to the point that we can tolerate until our body can tolerate that unless a medical doctor that knows the things more than I do says, under no conditions, give this person peanuts. But otherwise, we need to actually lean into that, which is a pretty good analogy, fam, for exposure and response prevention, isn't it? That's exactly right. And I talk about this all the time with kids, that you need to lean in these things. You need exposure to all these things. You need exposure to all these different foods. You're exactly right. The rates of peanut allergies were quintupling in this country as a direct result of all the schools that were eliminating peanut products from their cafeterias, the daycares that were saying you can't send peanut products and so on. That was a terrible idea. When you go to an allergist to get allergy shots, I'm putting that in quotes, you know what they're giving you? Little amounts of the protein that you're allergic to. It's exposure therapy, people. It always, always helps. And for folks that, again, have the privilege of not knowing the whole thing with allergy shots, again, it's not one exposure. It's, it's a schedule. You go in for shots, plural, over time. Why? Because we're going to continue to build upon that. And again, I'm not a medical doctor, so like, I can't speak. Uh, talk to your doctors but try and find one that knows what they're talking about because here's the other issue that you and I were talking about uh, you know, throughout the show is sometimes, and this is not a diss on doctors, I'm so grateful for the, the wonderful doctors that we have and the knowledge that they have, but also sometimes doctors, if they don't manage it, for example, like the GI in my situation, they don't know. So they say, I don't know. It sounds like you're having a reaction and you're already having some gastritis and, and gut flares, uh, take, out, take out the milk. But that's not based on their medical training. That's based on kind of what seems like a common sense, logical next step, which is where a lot of people are doing like that progression on their own. They're like, okay, 
I'm restricting this. I'm actually going to restrict all the things and then slowly add them back in because the one thing I react to or the second thing I react to, those are the things that must have been causing the problem. And it's flawed logic, right? Exactly. Yeah. I'm so fired up in this conversation. <laughs> but I think it's it's such an important thing. And honestly, we had some different ideas that we were going to talk about today, fam. So some of this is just proliferated through our conversation. But I think it, it's covering such a broad spectrum of variables that then impact your gut health are going to impact whether you end up experiencing this IBS presentation. And it really can wreak havoc. And so I have some friends. This is a fan, right? So we keep it real. Sometimes we uh, maybe have to tell people how it is and you don't necessarily like to hear it. I know I have friends that may listen to this and go, don't come after my elimination diets. I'm trying to find some relief here. But that's what we're talking about, the relief. And it's counterintuitive, much like many people find ERP to be. That's exposure and response prevention is actually we need to expose ourselves to that and not eliminate everything or avoid as a form of compulsion to be able to progress. Unless, and I'm not going to say there aren't outliers. If your medical doctor is like, we have gone in, we have examined this under no condition, do not play with this, then follow that doctor's advice. But we can become armchair doctors sometimes and go, well, it must be my inability to process this or this. And it's like, let's slow down. And I'm hopeful that this information will be illuminating to more people. And so as we come to a close today, I would love to talk about, and we touched on it a little bit earlier, but we were talking about that opportunistic nature of OCD and how emotionally loaded it can feel, especially if you're dealing with or maybe even living with somebody that is immune suppressed or like OCD loves to launch into that and harm themes. But you imagine like, oh, but then if I got sick and my person or someone in my family struggling with this, it becomes even more distressing. And we can also get to that place where we're worried about, but what if my stomach starts to make noises, it gargles, it bubbles, it does these different things. And so it becomes... That could be embarrassing or even humiliating. Right. 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 Or what if I go into a space, uh, you know, and I might worry and have some disgust about how dirty the public restroom is and how gross. And now we can get so zoomed in to anything that might lead to that path needs to be eliminated or avoided at all costs. This can be really, really tricky. So as we bring it back to OCD and as we said, Melissa is a generalist. She can see this across more than just OCD. But we can see how OCD can thrive in that environment because that is OCD. That is the function of OCD. And it's why, too, earlier, I know that you mentioned ARFID. We were also talking before we started recording about orthorexia in terms of whether it's the dyes or different things in my food. Is it clean enough? Am I going to have this negative reaction? Is it going to have this uh, effect on me? Which is oversimplifying it, folks, if you want to learn more about orthorexia. Uh, there's more to it than that. But we also know that exposure and response prevention therapy works really well for folks with eating disorders. And we start to understand why, again, the model is the same, whether it's exposing ourselves to the environment, exposing ourselves to the foods, exposing ourselves to the feared stimulus, and getting out there and allowing ourselves, allowing our gut to repopulate the proper healthy balance of growth that it needs. I mean, it can get really, really complicated. And so it makes sense why all of these can really compound in tandem and go, ah, and wreak a lot of havoc in someone's life. So what we're going to do is we're going to think about some of the resources. And Melissa, you've written a couple of books. You actually have another one coming out very soon, a treatment manual for therapists and practitioners that want to know more and be able to help treat patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And I pulled this up, and it might even be a pre-order possibility. Is the new book CBT for patients with inflammatory bowel disease? It sure is. Yes. Yeah, so it's already like Amazon's already like, watch out, y'all. It's coming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also written other books as well, Reclaim Your Life from IBS. And then I also see here Coping with Crohn's and Colitis, A Patient and Clinician's Guide to CBT for IBD. 
And so those are really great resources. We were also talking before we started recording about the GastroPsych Rome Foundation. And for clinicians out there, if you're seeing this in your client population or you're just hearing this and you're like, this makes sense. It reads for me and I want to learn more about this. In addition to Melissa's book that you can get your hands on it and be able to go through that treatment process, there is this website and I'm going to put it in the blog and you can check that out in terms of different trainings. But as we approach closing this conversation, which is hard because I've enjoyed it so much, I feel like I could just keep talking. But we were talking a little bit before recording about the need for more understanding, not only in the subfield, but also the crossover between this and our psychiatrists and our doctors. And so it's not just do we need more mental health therapists or psychologists understanding this or researchers, although that would be great. We're always for more research. But we need more psychiatrists as well, and we need more GI doctors. It's not medically managed, then they're not going to know. But could there be grand rounds or uh, a medium where we could say, but here's what I wouldn't recommend. You don't have to know how to manage it, but please don't recommend these things. So a quick note here, too. We've talked a lot about the things that we don't really want you doing. We haven't talked as much about what you should be doing. We can have one of these GI conditions. So particularly with IBS. The good news is that GI-informed cognitive behavioral therapy is actually very, very effective at reducing the symptom burden of IBS and improving health-related quality of life. And, you know, ideally, you want to be with somebody who's the, the GI expertise, but who also knows all the general treatment protocols for things like OCD, right? right. So it's nice to find a therapist who's a one-stop shop, but even if you can't, Finding a therapist who has some GI knowledge, which you can find, there's a whole therapist directory on the Rome Foundation website that Nicole's going to link in her blog across different states. You might actually be able to set up at least a few consultation sessions with someone who has that expertise. And the good news is that it's really very effective. We can really reduce a lot of the anxiety and catastrophizing about worries about bathrooms, worries about toileting rituals, worries about chirochecal incontinence highly restrictive, overly restrictive, inappropriate diets that cause a lot of fear and anxiety for people. We can address all of those things and you really can get a lot of relief. There's no reason to continue to suffer when the GI disorder like IBS treatment is absolutely available and it works. Yeah, I love that because it is important to highlight that hope and also exposure, exposure, exposure. Right. And as we know within the OCD community, that even when you get some phobias about things and you can see how the overlapping can feel very similar between obsessional compulsive activity and phobic feelings, what we know, what research shows us even more broadly on a CBT level is how exposure can be so helpful with phobias. And so just decreasing that anxiety. And most people are going to be like, exposure, no thanks. Check, please. I don't like that. In fact, I'm afraid of that because when I eat things, when I've done this, I felt more sick. And again, we might have some of that extinction burst there, right, Melissa, in terms of we are. Exactly. You're right. We don't have defenses there in the gut. So if we don't rebuild it or I just had a field of dreams moment, if you don't build it, it won't come. Right. <laughs> so I need to rebuild the gut, the gut, the biomes and all the things. And so I love pointing to that as well. So all these resources are going to be linked over on the blog again. And Melissa, this has been such a treat. If you would ever want to come back and have a, a, another chat, but also Melissa presents and has been doing so much work just to get this information out there because especially within this subsection of where we look at gut health and the gut brain connection, we're just lacking across the board, practitioners, doctors, psychiatrists. And so if you're interested in learning more, please do. I think this is just such a relevant issue. And Melissa is one person, y'all. So she is helping teach us how to fish. And we can go learn how to fish even more. And if more than one of us knows how to fish, then we can help more people. So that is just my little plea to action here for any fellow colleagues listening. 
If you're interested in learning more, please do, because there's more of a connection than people realize, and this offers a lot more hope. And we didn't even get into the SSRI part of the conversation, so yeah, I mean... We did not. More to come. More to, more to come. come. Another conversation for another day, but thank you so much for your time, Melissa. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This is kind of my, my passion and my mission in life now, is spreading the word about this stuff and really helping people get relief. So thank you for the chance to do so. Absolutely. And so now we all get to benefit from this message and appreciate all the hard work you've done. Thank you for that. All right, fam. How interesting and fantastic was that? I am just so incredibly grateful for you, Melissa. Again, so many thanks. That was so very helpful. And I am inspired to learn even more. So again, fam check out this episode's blog to check out Melissa's ADAA talk, more info on her, the amazing resources we just talked about over at ocdfamilypodcast.com. And that brings us to our intrusive thought segment, which for newer fam is my application segment of the show, where we think about what we've heard and we figure out ways that we can apply this new learning today. So for today's application challenge, I'm going to encourage you to practice exposing yourself to life, fam. And because we're creative and unique with unique fears and challenges, I want you to honor that and get creative in what this might look like for you or your family. But since I know sometimes we are living in the trenches with our OCD warriors and we're like, you know what? I have distress like to my ears. I can't think of anything. I'm going to give you a springboard here, fam, to launch some ideas off of and what this might look like. So the idea we're going to try is to expand the ecology of our guts while also pursuing value-driven goals that OCD has tried to hold hostage. Because whether your world has shrunk down or not, we talked with Melissa about how just getting out there, living our lives, exposure, not only helps with our microbial diversity, but we also know the power of that practice in creating new learning in the OCD brain. And I think it's most helpful and fulfilling and to the point when we think about what our value-driven activities and pursuits may be. Maybe things we've missed or something we've always wanted to try but have felt too distressed to even approach. Because if we do that, the win in expanding our environmental exposure will be greater than just for our gut health. So I'll give the examples and then we'll call it a day, fam, because I want you and your loved ones to get out there and get to living more freely. But again, examples can help. So here you go. Say you haven't been to a Target or a preferred store lately, and maybe you miss seeing the cute new items or the tech gadgets or foods or styles that are like so 2024. <laughs> and I want you to practice moving toward that. Whether that means you're sifting through Bullseye's playground or just walking around the parking lot and not avoiding all the passers-by, that's a win. So think about it, personalize it, make it your own, make it work. Maybe a food that you're like, so many nopes, not even going to try it. Or maybe even a previous food that you used to enjoy that you now avoid and you're going to be like, what? Don't go there, Nicole. Yes, I'm going there. I want you to be willing to think about it and to try it. What's holding you or your loved ones back, fam? Is it the fear? Is it the discomfort? Is it literal pain? GI distress? I get it. As one of the one in three that have OCD and this GI distress, I get it. But on the other side of that fear are those really cool target finds. Is that cheeseburger? Is re-engagement with the lives we miss? And the good news as far as the gut and our brain goes, on the other side of exposure is greater health. And I don't know about you, fam, but that is serving me an extra helping of hope. So what's limiting you? What are you avoiding? What do you miss? Let's target the ecology of our guts and the freedom in our minds. And let's get back to living. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD Family Podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit OCDFamilyPodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the demo on the family 
chatter. Oh yeah, nothing says family like taking care of your gut and kicking OCD's butt. That's right, I went there. And you can too at OCDFamilyPodcast.com.